Lecture 2 of the Canopy Wind Analysis and Design Course. In this second lecture, we will start exploring the application of the ASCE 7 standard to determine wind loads for our freestanding canopy. In Lecture 1, we used a digital simulation software to study the effects of wind on the canopy. While this exercise yielded valuable insights into the interaction between wind and the structure, the results remain inconclusive for practical design. So, we need to use an official design standard like ASC7 to figure out the loads that can actually be used for design purposes. According to ASC7, there are two main factors to consider when determining wind loads wind velocity pressure, which we refer to as Q, and wind design pressure, which we call P. Let's start with velocity pressure. Simply put, velocity pressure is based on the wind speed, but it's adjusted to account for the characteristics of the site's terrain. To calculate Q, we need more than just the wind speed. We also need information about the terrain's roughness, the ground elevation, and other topographical factors such as whether the structure is located on a hill. In other words, Q focuses on the site's location and its surroundings, not the structure itself. Once we have Q, we use it to calculate wind design pressure, P. Wind design pressure takes Q into account, but adds other factors related to the structure. These include rigidity, how flexible or rigid the structure is, which affects how gusts amplify wind pressure. Symmetry and wind directionality, the relationship between the structure's symmetry and the wind direction, which influences the design pressure. Shape and orientation of the parts of the structure that are directly exposed to the wind. Now let's dive deeper into wind velocity pressure Q and look at what it depends on. According to ASC 722, there is a coefficient for each of these attributes. This is exposure coefficient, KZT is topographical factor, this is ground elevation factor, and V is basic wind speed in meters per second. Using these coefficients, we can write the equation for Q as, this equation gives us velocity pressure in newtons per square meter. Let's examine the rationale behind assigning values to each of these coefficients. Let's start with basic wind speed. Imagine you're standing in an open field and suddenly a strong gust of wind hits you. That quick burst is what we're interested in. Basic wind speed is all about capturing the intensity of these short wind bursts. Specifically, it's the peak 3-second gust measured 10 meters above the ground in open terrain. Now where do we get these values? ASCE 722 has us covered. This standard provides the basic wind speeds across the United States. These values come from years of historical wind data, carefully analyzed through meteorological studies and statistical methods. It's like having a wind speed diary that's been kept and updated for decades. Different regions have varying wind speeds due to local climatic conditions. For instance, coastal areas generally experience higher wind speeds thanks to strong ocean winds, while inland areas tend to be calmer. To account for these regional variations and ensure appropriate design, ASCE 7 provides a set of four contour maps. Each map depicts wind speed values for different risk categories. What are risk categories, you ask? The standard categorizes structures based on the risk they pose to human life if they fail. Here's why risk categories matter. Not all structures are created equal. ASCE categorizes structures based on the risk they pose to human life if they fail. Think about it. A hospital or an emergency shelter needs to be extra sturdy, right? These fall into higher risk categories and are designed to withstand higher wind speeds. On the other hand, structures like agricultural buildings, which pose less risk to human life, can be designed for lower wind speeds. These adjustments ensure that we prioritize safety and resilience for critical infrastructure. 
It's all about designing structures that are not just strong, but also economical. For our bus terminal, since it is a high occupancy structure, it falls under risk category 3. By the way, the risk categories are explained in Table 1.5-1 on page 5 of the standard. This means we need to use the wind speed map for category 3 to determine the basic wind speed. According to this map, found on pages 270 and 271, the basic wind speed for the coastal region of Southern California, where our bus terminal is located, is 45 meters per second. Alternatively, we can use the online ASCE hazard tool to determine the value for basic wind speed. The tool requires us to specify the location of the structure and its risk category. In return, it gives us the basic wind speed. Next, let's see how the ground elevation factor is determined. When determining wind loads on structures, the ground elevation factor, Ke, accounts for changes in air density with elevation. According to ASCE 722, Ke is equal to 1 at sea level, where air density is highest. As elevation increases, air density decreases, leading to a corresponding reduction in wind pressure. Thus, Ke is always less than 1 at higher elevations. This ensures that wind load calculations appropriately reflect the reduced wind pressure at elevated sites, allowing engineers to design structures safely and efficiently for their geographic context. We can show the relationship between ground elevation and Ke using a graph like this. The graph shows how Ke approaches one at sea level and decreases as elevation increases. Here is the mathematical equation for the graph. The equation is derived from the standard atmospheric model which defines how air pressure and density decrease exponentially with altitude based on empirical observations and physical principles of the Earth's atmosphere. ASCE 7 provides a table of Ke values for specific elevations, so we can use either the table or the equation. Alternatively, for elevations above sea level, a conservative value of 1 for Ke can be used, as stated in the standard. Our bus terminal is located in Oxnard, California, with an average ground elevation of only 15 meters above sea level, so we expect a Ke of close to 1. Using the equation, we obtain a value of 0 0.998. After rounding, we get a Ke of 1. Next, let's take a closer look at what the topographical factor is all about. As wind moves across the landscape, it flows steadily over flat terrain. But when it hits hills, ridges, or steep drops like escarpments, something interesting happens. The wind speeds up. This speed up creates stronger wind pressure, especially in the upper half of a hill or ridge, or near the top of an escarpment. We need to account for this effect to make sure our buildings are safe. We use something called the topographical factor, which adjusts the wind pressure calculations to reflect these unique conditions shaped by the terrain. This factor ensures that our structures are designed to withstand the stronger winds that occur in these specific areas. The topographical factor, KZT, is given by... This equation is a function of three key parameters. K1, K2, and K3. K1 deals with the slope of the hill. A steeper slope means faster wind and higher pressure on the structure, so K1 captures how steepness affects wind speed. K2 is about the structure's location relative to the hill's crest. The further you move from the crest, the less wind pressure there is. K3 considers the height of the structure. Wind pressure tends to decrease as you go higher, so K3 reflects how pressure changes with elevation. Let's examine these three parameters more closely, 
starting with K1. Generally speaking, the wind velocity profile looks like this. At the surface, the wind speed is zero, but as you move higher, it increases exponentially until it eventually levels off at a constant speed. When wind flows over a hill, the velocity profile changes. At the hill's crest, the wind speed is still zero right at the surface, but the exponential rise in velocity becomes steeper as you go higher. Let's define a couple of terms here. H is the height from the ground level to the crest of the hill. L sub H is the horizontal distance from the crest to the point where the hill is half its height, measured in the upwind direction, the direction the wind is coming from. For example, if the wind is blowing from left to right, the left side of the hill is the upwind direction, and the right side is the downwind direction. The ratio of H to L sub H is used by ASCE7 to determine K1. This ratio is critical in assessing wind effects. ASCE figure 26.8-1 provides K1 values for various H to LH ratios. If your ratio falls between the listed values, you can use linear interpolation. But here's an important note. If the ratio exceeds 0.5, ASCE recommends using a maximum value of 0.5 for the calculations. As you can see, the higher the ratio, or in other words, the steeper the hill, the larger the K1 value. This reflects the greater impact of the hill's slope on wind pressure. Since our bus terminal is situated on flat terrain, rather than on a hill or escarpment, the K1 value is zero. K2 is a function of the distance between the structure and the crest of the hill. The further a building is located from the crest, the slower the wind speed, resulting in reduced pressure on the structure. ASCE 7 provides guidance for determining K2 values in figure 26.8-1. These values are based on the ratio of X to L sub H, where X represents the horizontal distance between the crest and the structure. As the ratio increases, indicating the structure is farther from the crest, you can observe a significant decrease in K2. For hill slopes, K2 drops to zero, when the structure is positioned below the halfway point on the windward side of the hill. More specifically, if x is greater than L sub h, k2 becomes zero. In our case, since the bus terminal is on flat terrain, we use a k2 value of zero. k3 depends on the height at which we want to calculate wind pressure. While wind speed increases near the crest of a hill, it eventually levels off at higher elevations. This curve illustrates the wind velocity profile at ground level. This curve represents wind velocity near the crest of the hill. The speed up factor, K3, can be thought of as the measure of the difference between these two curves. Notice that beyond a certain point, as z, the height at which we calculate wind pressure, increases, the speed up factor diminishes. At sufficiently high elevations, K3 becomes zero. ASCE 7 in figure 26.8-1 provides a table for K3 values as a function of the ratio z over L sub h. The table shows that K3 decreases rapidly as the z over L sub h increases. Since our bus terminal is situated on flat terrain, the topographical factor kzt simplifies to 1. This is because k1, k2, and k3 are not applicable for structures on flat terrain. You may be wondering why we took the time to discuss how to determine k1, k2, and k3, even though they are not directly applicable to this problem. 
The reason is that understanding these factors is crucial for analyzing wind loads in more complex terrain scenarios. By exploring their definitions and how they influence wind pressure, you can develop a stronger foundation for applying the ASCE 7 standard in a variety of structural design contexts. This knowledge prepares us to tackle challenges where topographical effects play a critical role. We will discuss the exposure coefficient and continue our wind analysis presentation in the next lecture.